Um, hi everyone, this is Ken. Um, today um, I'll be talking on some updates on um, the companies that reported last week. Uh, then Yongkai will be talking about uh, one of his uh, US companies that he recently initiated on. Okay, so on the outlook for the markets, there have been no changes to our general outlook. Um, macro data still generally supportive of an equity bull run. Second half, um, grow the Global GDP growth is expected to be stronger than the first half. Inflation is still not a concern. A long-term upward trend for stocks intact, but caution needed on the short term as price is extended for the S&P 500. So on some of the companies that reported last week, um, we have um, among them, we have City Development and OUE. On City Development, um, it's currently not rated. Um, net profit was up 48% year on year, but propped up by disposal gains. Otherwise, core earnings were down 50% year on year. Hotels under pressure from rising supply in Singapore and management is bearish on property development due to policy pressures and instead they are looking towards London for development properties uh, opportunities. Outlook is fairly neutral although strong balance sheet implies management is beating their time. On OUE, we continue to have an accumulate at $2.89, uh, sorry, uh, with a target price of $3.24. Uh, they reported a 15.8% year-on-year increase in second quarter mainly due to higher revenue recognition from project Twin Peaks. Additionally, higher market costs incurred for the Twin Peaks project coupled with increase in admin, cost, admin expenses, including your staff costs, resulted in the group registering lower year-on-year -year net profit. The higher finance expenses were the only, only negative surprises. We are positive to note that the asset spin-off plan is successfully completed. While principal approval has been obtained to convert part of 6 Chenton Way into a mixed development, of retail service apartment office space. This could potentially unlock greater value for the strategic site. On Noble, which is also not rated, um, first half net profit declined 66% year on year to 104 million on lower gross margins. Record first half revenue of 47.9 billion was well supported by strong underlining bulk commodity volumes with record six month tonnage of 110 million. Um, to note, the grains and oil seed origination and trading business, however, suffered due to continued supply chain issues in Brazil, while Ukraine has also proven to be a challenging market. Management guide for agricultural business to focus on ensuring its newly completed assets achieve operating excellence. And management also expressed confidence that Nova can continue to exploit the current adverse market condition to its longer term benefit. On Roma, we continue to have to accumulate. Uh, with target price of $3.61. Um, Call net profits up 42% year on year. Palm and Loric PBT um, up 40% year on year on expanded capacity. Oil and grain also um, uh, they, uh, registered a loss year on year, still plagued by industry overcapacity in China as PBT per ton declines. But we, we do expect continued positive contributions in second half of this year. Consumer PBT up 67% year on year as price reductions drove sales and margins were up year on year on lower feedstock costs. Plantations PBT were lower 34% year on year on lower yields and falling CPO prices. Overall outlook is positive for second half and we should see sugar milling turn profitable in the second half. On Golden Agri, first half net profit of 158 million was down 41.5% um, year on year. Um, the weaker than below um, performance was attributed to lower CPO prices, which fell 24.9% year on year. Additionally, production was poorer due to palm trees' biological slowdown following the bumper crop last year. Production costs has also increased due to higher fertilization, uh, fertilizer application, and we believe CPO prices is likely to stay muted in the immediate term due to seasonal increase in production, while demand is expected to re remain lackluster given the anticipated pated, um, higher soya bean oil um, supply from the US. On OCBC, uh, we remain neutral. Um, second half, uh, second quarter, so uh, corn net impact of uh, 597 million meets our estimates on higher mark to market losses from Great Eastern's uh, non-participate, uh, non-par funds. And uh, this um, mark to market losses are expected to, uh, may expect may, be, may continue as um, the um, long-term interest rates uh, move up further. 
on net interest margins, they were stable quarter on quarter at 1.64%. Loans growth was, was exceptional this quarter at uh, 7% quarter on quarter. Fees and commission was also at a record high driven by wealth management and loan related fees. Net trading income did reasonably well on strong customer flow. Moving forward, management seems to be more cautious, guiding for very low uh, loans growth and also um, that management guide that uh, fees and commission may slow. On Gunting, uh, we also have a neutral. We maintain neutral on Gunting for a target price of $1.37. Uh, second quarter NPAT of um, 140 million was higher 1.3% uh, year on year and 21% quarter on quarter. Revenue was marginally higher uh, year on year due to contributions from Marine Life Park and other non gaming revenue. This mitigated the lower gaming revenue. Um, VIP volumes was up, um, which was a positive, up 30% year on year. However, win rates uh, were down from uh, 3.13 to 2.5, and that resulted in lower gaming revenue. Um, year on year and quarter on quarter growth in a higher margin mass market was, however, guided to be only marginally higher. Potential re rating catalysts may, however, need to wait. Now, moving on to our uh, stock for today, um, over to Yongkai. Hi, I'm Yong Kai. I'm the analyst covering U.S. equities. So today I'll uh, be talking about Iconex Brand Group, which is listed on Nasdaq. Okay, um, as of last Friday, the share price was $33. The, it's actually on a high range of the 52 week. The fully title shares is 73 million compared to the current outstanding shares of about 24 or 54 million. That's because uh, there's two trenches of comfortable bonds that might be converted at today's prices. Market cap fully diluted is about 2.5 billion. Okay, so what it does is actually it focuses solely on the marketing, advertising, and licensing of its 33 consumer brands. These brands collectively chalk up a total of $13 billion global annual retail sales. It's actually ranked number two global licensor only after Disney and ahead of more well-known brands such as Calvin Klein, Mattel, the toy maker for Barbie dolls, as well as Warner Brothers, uh, which is have DC Comics. Under this uh, very unique business model, Iconix actually bears no operational nor inventory risks, such as sales, sourcing, or warehousing. That, so there's zero chance of having obsolete inventory or write downs. There's also no need for working capital or capital expenditures. What you can see is uh, some, just some of the 33 brands. You are more familiar with Singaporeans could be Echo, Peanuts, um, and as well as OP and Umbro. Uh, so th this is just an illustration of roughly what's the value chain that it covers. Um, so it's not really just concentrated on one particular group of consumers. So uh, Iconix only uh, deals with two kinds of licenses. One is direct to retail. So under this model, uh, you have exclusive rights to one brand. So for example, Walmart can only deal with OP, Danskin. Uh, Sears Kmart can only deal with Joe Boxer, for example. Uh, this stores represented 30% of the last year's revenue. The other kind is traditional wholesale. So what, what this means is that you just license, uh, sign a licensing contract with uh, wholesalers such as Li and Fong. And this, uh, the largest wholesaler contributed 6% of last year's revenue. So uh, there's quite a few merits. Firstly, there's high customer demands because uh, they can earn high private label like margins. Essentially, this means that it's either Walmart does its private label or it pays Iconics roughly about 3% of its uh, gross revenue to license its brands and thereby can incur higher operating uh, margin. It also means that they get to control the uh, the sourcing, manufacturing, uh, inventory, retailing, so they do have a lot of uh, influence over this. In the last five years, Iconix actually successfully branded $7 billion of annual sales from previously unbranded or private label programs. This is uh, out of the $13 billion sales that is recording this year. Uh, so just two quick excerpts from the founder and CEO. Uh, he said that one of the brands is in the 13th year and another brand is in the 12th year. They get addicted to the large market share, making incredible margins because they source directly and they have a lot of control over these exclusive brands. Of course, they do have some renewals, uh, some non-renewals, but now of it is contracts that pay more than $10 million. Last year's revenue was about $350 million, so $10 million contract is about 3% sales which isn't that material. Of, on top of which, they have six of them that does over $1 billion of sales, and every single one of them has been renewed it's ever since they started the direct-to-retail model. 
So this is just a quick look uh, of how they convert the large volume business, how it looks organized and uh, it's quite attractive. A few other merits are high recurring, high margin recurring revenues. So every licensed contract comes with contractually guaranteed minimum royalty payments. So if they don't hit the sales target, if the licensees or wholesalers don't hit the sales target, Iconex can still expect to collect a minimum amount. As of first January this year, it's 600 plus million dollars, which is more than uh, one year's revenue. Uh, last year's revenue was 353 million dollars, yet only 148 employees are required. This works out to average of 2.5 million revenue per employee. Furthermore, the net margins are really high. You have 35% net margins at EBITDA of 60 plus percent, which is really incredible. Management is also very disciplined when it comes to capital allocation. They have publicly stated that with every acquisition, they will ask themselves whether is it better to buy iconic stock. So should we buy Umbro or should we buy iconic stock? Uh, they repurchased about 12 million shares since the start of this year at an average price of 25.40. Uh, this is actually very wise on hindsight because now the share price is around 30, 30 plus dollars. They have issued, they have authorized another new uh, repurchase program. Their acquisition criteria is pretty strict. Right now their average age is about 50 years old and they want it to be capable in multiple product categories so that they can extend the line. The targeted consumers, they are really looking at 70 to 80% recognition before they even consider and 65% of the purchase price has to be in guaranteed minimums. Overall, they expect to pay about five times of the average licensing fees, and these licensing fees are, are high gravy. You are looking at 60 plus percent EBITDA margins. Uh, lastly, you are looking at, uh, okay, there's a typo error. Uh, great partners or licensees such as Walmart, Li and Fong, because they recognize that these licensees are the ones that make or break. You, it's no point having a licensee that can guarantee $1 billion of revenue uh, in in minimum a minimum royalties if they can on if we cannot honor it. All in all they spend about one point nine billion dollars, which they expect to fully recoup by end of this year. Furthermore, there is a tax benefit from fifteen year amortization of intangible assets. So they get the tax deduction, but this doesn't affect the net income because the, the trademarks have indefinite useful life. Okay, so we just quickly go through two case studies. Nike actually purchased Umbro for $560 million in 07, but Iconics got it for 40% for of their price in somewhere around December 2012. Nike last time used to lose money for Umbro because of all the uh, inventory, manufacturing, retailing, and write-downs. But under the new model, under Iconics, they'll make money because of uh, it's purely licensing. So they're looking at around 75 to 80% EBITDA margins, which is 5 to 5.6 times uh, acquisition multiple. The case study two, we are talking about uh, United Media, which owns uh, the brand Peanuts. So uh, this Peanuts variety is actually quite interesting because they managed to negotiate a, 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 a feature film worldwide in 2015, which they get to collect a royalty of the uh, gross ticket receipts without any investment from their side. Okay, so just a quick uh, look. This, unfortunately, this they only disclose this uh, from the April 2010 and none after that. But you can see uh, this roughly how their brands have been performing uh, cut off as of April 2010. Uh, brands, brands that did really well like Rampage, OP, Starter for example, where they recoup more than half of it in just over a few years. So they have, this one of the last growth strategies international uh, is 33%, which is up from 6% four years ago. They have many JVs, 50-50 in China, India, Canada, Europe, and Latin America, starting from 20, uh, 2008. All of these are recorded under the equity method of accounting, which means that once they form the JV, the top line revenue will be deconsolidated immediately, and the earnings will appear under, uh, will appear above the uh, other income. So their partners are really reputable. We are looking at Silas Cho, which is behind the rejuvenation of Tommy Hilfiger because it got sold, yeah, as, as well as Michael Kors. We have Reliance Industries in India and Funding Group in Latin America. So they guided that there are probably two more JVs for remaining 2013. Uh, just a snapshot of how their JVs have performed. The Latin America's JV has been, the revenue is up 56% year over year and increase about five, six times in just over five years. Well, Iconics China, what they do is they actually own equity ownerships in 11 companies. 
They had monetized one of them in 2011, which they received $6 million pre-tax gain. Lastly, the, JVs, the new JVs all have puts and calls that enable them to uh, repurchase the interest and, and consolidate the results because the management feels that right now they're not given enough credit for the international growth. Okay, just a snapshot. You are looking at image makeover before. Uh, so they're quite limited floor space, no brand signage, very weak positioning. So it's all very not visible. But after, it's actually something that's very prominent. And because these brands are usually exclusive to the particular store, if you want to buy OP, you can only get it at Walmart. So they actually give it uh, a lot of uh, a lot of retailing space as well as they try to push for the prominence. The product nine extension, O eight to O ten, you have quite a lot of new products coming up. Retail store penetration, the number of stores increased by around fifty percent uh, in three to five years. So lastly, we are talk about uh, low cost financing. So even though interest rates now are pretty low, but it's still very impressive that they can manage to borrow at 4.27% uh, since last October. Interest rate will be resetting in 2020, so that's roughly when we expect that they'll probably have to refinance it. Meanwhile, they are actually paying about $60, billion, $60 million of principal every year out of their $875 million debt. So it's about roughly 7%, and this keeps its debt load in check. Previously, we also talked about two trenches of convertibles. Uh, they are actually issued at very high premiums, 75% in 2011 and 53% in March this year. But because the share price has went up so much, we're assuming that uh, it's only inevitable that these convertibles will be converted uh, in a matter of time. So uh, look at historical financials. Revenue has been doing very well. It's went up 28% since 2006. Okay, there's a slight marginal dip, but that's because we have a brand transition and you only have one acquisition that contributed one month worth of revenue. Uh, management has guided for a revenue to increase 22% this year. Then income free cash flow have increased uh, much as well. Uh, the thing is that free cash flow is much higher than net income because there's uh, substantial deferred income taxes. Remember we talked about the tax amortization over 15 years, so this results in substantial uh, tax liability. There's also a amortization of comfortable notes discount. Uh, as of this year, there's still $120 million of uh, notes discount that has to be amortized over the lifetime. The 26% CAGR for free cash flow is slightly behind the revenue because of different cost structure. For some peanuts, uh, there's a contractual revenue sharing, so it only contributes 30% EBITDA margin compared to 60 to 70% average for the rest of Econix brands. So uh, look at the second quarter results, revenue is up 23%, free cash flow up 17%. However, these results are actually benefited from one-off recognition uh, due to the 50% stake sale in Canada JV. So uh, for the rest of this year, actually, the deconsolidation will affect and result in uh, around $3.5 million of revenue loss, which is why they maintains the 2013 guidance for revenue and free cash flow. But the diluted EPS guidance has actually increased by 10 cents to reflect fewer outstanding shares. Uh, later on, we are not actually forecasting any uh, acquisitions, but if they do deploy half its uh, available cash balance on acquisitions, we will expect incremental revenue and free cash flow growth of about 10% on an annualized basis. Okay, uh, this is the last slide. We're talking about the valuations. We're using a uh, discounted cash flow. So we use the mid-range of their free cash flow forecast and you deduct away $12 million of stock-based uh, compensation to arrive at a true economic free cash flow of $195 million. We also derive uh, its median term WACC to be 7.78%, uh, factoring in 10-year treasury yields of 4% as well as 40-60 equity to debt. So lastly, our uh, key assumption is 3% terminal growth. Okay, so this is actually uh, not very aggressive because this revenue has grown 28% as in this free cash flow has grown 26% since 2006. This uh, terminal growth G actually uh, factor in 2% domestic inflation as well as 5% international growth. Bear in mind that the Latin America um, JV actually increased its revenue five, six times since 2008. So 5% is actually, uh, is actually off a higher base. All in all, we'll expect Iconix to be worth $3.15 billion market cap. If we assume all its computer nodes is converted. If uh, we also, okay, so 
just for your information, we have included um, sensitivity analysis as an analysis. If G is lower or higher, or if the convertible bonds are not converted, this will be how it looks like. Okay, so all in all, we will expect a fair value of $43, which is a 28% upside from current market price. We reiterate a trading buy on this company. The, just so to wrap up, why are we recommending Iconix? Because it's a number two global licensor after Disney and ahead of many more reputable brands such as Mattel, as well as, um, as, well as the Warner Brothers. Then it's also earning very high margins, 35% nets, 60 plus percent EBITDA. It is a minimum guaranteed of 600 plus million dollars, which is more than one year revenue. Its international operations are growing very fast and it's a very well established acquisi uh, brand acquisition criteria. Lastly, it's also being very aggressive in buying back shares, 20% since the start of uh, 2013. It might not be buying back more shares, or it, it really depends on what is a better use of capital to acquire or to buy back. Yeah, uh, that's about all. So now we are open up, opening up for Q&A. Thank you. Hi, uh, there's a question whether our team has any comment on the soy, soy build reads. Is it worth to subscribe? Uh, okay, our team currently have no comments on that. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Who are Iconic competitors and how does it rank against them? Iconic is really unique because all it does is license out brands. So uh, in terms of competitors, we are looking at, say, your fashion brands, for example. You're looking at private labels. Whether is it more worthwhile for the, uh, for the stores like Walmart to use their private labels or pay 3% of to license the to license the brands from Iconics, is, is the brands worth the premium? From another perspective, Iconic competitors are also say private equity who will compete with them for uh, better brands. Admittedly and honestly, Iconics brands are, are roughly tier two. We're not talking about Calvin Klein or Barbie doll for example, which is why Iconics get to acquire them for five times EBITDA as well, and they have less competition from the more well-funded private equity. Hi, uh, so, so you are actually free to ask questions on the Singapore market as well. Thank you. Hi, uh, regarding the question on soy build, uh, I'm, anyway, I'm Lucas covering the real estate uh, sector. On soy build, read, is it worth, the question is, is it worth to subscribe? Um, we do not actually want to uh, uh, come to a conclusion on that, but uh, is the soy build REIT is actually compromising of 50 industrial REIT, which is kind of, uh, at this point in time, the, the REIT rental levels is actually trending on a high, and uh, valuation for this will actually be on the higher side if they were to release right now for industrial sector within the real estate uh, uh, sub-market. Sub so with that in mind, you do exercise caution and do actually take a look into all the individual uh, industrial performance, build, building performance in their prospectus. Uh, is because uh, we feel that rental for industrial is actually now on the on the three to five year high at current levels. So do be a bit cautious when subscribing for it. Hi, uh, Joshua here. Okay, we have a question on tapering. So coming back to the tapering, do you think the tapering by the Fed will start in mid September? Um, Hard to say, but actually, um, at the current pace of data, I think the possibility is actually rising. So, um, so it could be. Um, and we hold on to the view, basically, that if the, if tapering does start by mid-September, actually, I think quite a lot 
have of it has already been priced in. We've had um, you know uh, um, bubbles in the market already uh, regarding this regarding this tapering. And um, actually, I think on the whole, the market's getting used to the thought that um, it's actually a signal of a stronger economy. And so tapering, um, even if there is um, some sort of short-term correction um, to it, I think it'll prove to be a buying opportunity and uh, does not spell the end of the bull market at all. Um, if anything, tapering is much worse for bonds than it is for stocks. And uh, portfolio managers will probably be looking to reallocate more into stocks if tapering does start. Thank you. So what is your view on China's economy in the second half? Um, I think our view is that it's going to improve. Actually, um, we're seeing some improvement in terms of um, profit, right? The uh, aggregate profit level for industrial profit is actually uh, turning positive. And um, we had a good spat of data, although I don't like to put too much emphasis on just one month because the data has been um, uh, erratic. And um, but actually, I think that um, all in, you know, because of better industrial profit numbers, which has turned around already, um, we are probably going to see a better second half. Hi, uh, so we have another question on whether Iconics is regarded as a growth stock rather than value stock. Does it have a dividend policy to uh, shareholders? Okay, Iconics is definitely a growth stock. So if you look at the revenue, it's grown 28% every year since, 28% uh, since 2006. Free cash flow has increased by 26%. Share price has increased by 500% since 2004, even though it's uh, this diluted shares has uh, increased by two times. So this Iconics is definitely a growth stock and there's still a lot of momentum going for it. It's, uh, International is expanding very fast and it's generating a lot of uh, free cash flow that is using it to acquire other brands or share buybacks. For that reason, it has no dividend policy to shareholders because it thinks it's better to utilize this capital uh, for acquisitions or buybacks. Thank you. All right, there's a question here of, are we going through the market's charts today? Oh, I'm very happy for this question because we thought that if we keep doing it every week, you might be bored. So it shows that you actually want these charts. Um, okay, actually, the reason why we skipped it this week because there's not much change from our, our previous view and we wanted to place more emphasis on earnings this week. And um, we continue to hold the view that um, bull markets are on. Um, however, the outperformance of the U.S. market indicates that um, it might be we actually do a, a small pullback. Um, Asian markets, however, have lagged the US markets and we are of the view that those will play catch up. Um, there's a question on Cod Life. Um, any comments on Cod Life? Well, um, on Cod Life, uh, we continue. We are we continue to be positive on it. Uh, this is because of the uh, positives from uh, um, the growth potential from its overseas markets. Also, um, the recent um, change in China's uh, policy of uh, not of uh, deviating away from the one child one child policy that may bring a bit of upside given its uh, ten percent stake in China Cod.
Hi, we have a question on uh, what sectors of U.S. stocks do we consider um, attractive. Well, um, I think because we have uh, an outlook of an improving uh, second half, it would be materials and industrials. And we also note that all sectors, um, the all sector um, service sector is actually um, starting to break um, a um, key resistance line. Okay, for these, for the ETFs to play the U.S. sectors, if you look at our last week's um, webinar, we actually have them all laid out quite nicely in one chart. Okay, for the exchange traded funds to to play on U.S. sectors. Okay, we have a question on Wilma here. Hold on. Hi. Uh, this question is with regards to. Any upside on uh, Wilma? Uh, re reiterate our rating on Wilma as a uh, cumulate. We see uh, uh, Wilma as a very close proxy to the uh, growth, uh, the, to the growth of our food demand over in the emerging markets, especially in uh, China and uh, India. Even though in near term, even though in the near term. Even though in the near term we will see we will still be able to we will still see near term uh, pressure on the on the particular stock as uh, in the near term because of its uh, crushing business as well as the uh, uh, over over capacity over capacity issues over their palm refining business. Hi. Uh, Hope you can hear us by now. Hi, um, Ken here. Uh, there are a few questions on um, some counters like Yongnam, uh, Biosensors, Indo Agri. However, we do not have any coverage on it, um, similar to the Australian market. So unfortunately, um, no comments on these uh, counters and markets uh, for time being. Yep. And uh, thank you everyone for um, participating in today's webinar and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you.